All right, welcome everyone to this presentation. So I'm happy to see you here. Um, I want to start immediately with a disclaimer because the title of my talk is Changing Physics Education with Julia, but of course physics is a quite general term. Uh, in this talk I will be talking specifically about nonlinear dynamics, but I truly believe that what I will present can apply and help many different fields of physics. Uh, definitely contains matter physics, for example. So, uh, some years ago, in uh, JuliaCon 2018, I gave a presentation called Why Julia is the most suitable language for, for science. Uh, today I want to connect with this old talk, but because not everyone here will have seen this talk, let me just show you a, a, a small 30 second excerpt from this uh, previous talk. Uh, so I have taken many classes in uh, nonlinear dynamics, and I can tell you you cannot study them without a computer. All right, this is very important. However, in all of these classes I have taken, nobody have ever shown me code ever. So I was wondering why would nobody show code? And the answer is simple: well, code is complicated. You have to explain it, and code is very, very large. That's uh, the main concern. So I believe Julia can change this. I believe Julia can change physics education because now you don't have to show this; you can just show this. And I think this is really important. All right, so the short uh, story is that in this previous presentation I, ex I expressed a dream, a dream that uh, Julia can change physics education for the better. So let me tell you, I am extremely proud to give today's presentation because what I will talk about is exactly the realization of this dream. So we formulated a new way to teach nonlinear dynamics that uh, uses Julia. And in the following slides, I will discuss why we did it and how we did it and what are the benefits. Uh, so first, let's put things into perspective. So the, the thing is that most of the time you really cannot do nonlinear dynamics in practice without computer code. You really need to use a computer because most things are not resolved analytically. Curiously, most standard or the well-accepted and well-known textbooks on the subject have no mentioning of code whatsoever. They have some exercises maybe that will say at some appendix or some place, yeah, maybe you can compute this, but they really say nothing about how to actually compute things. And it gets even worse, unfortunately, because 99% of published papers on nonlinear dynamics do not share code. They simply do not care to do this. And, and in fact, the dynamical systems.jl library started exactly because some extremely well-known algorithms were not readily available. So what I think is that this, there is this large dissonance between code and science, because code is not part of neither teaching nor publishing. And I think this is a really big problem. So we were thinking for a long time how can we solve this or how can we change this? And at the, after a lot of uh, effort, we concluded that the best way to, to change this is to teach the new generation to embrace code as an integral part of science and the learning subject. Of course, this requires a completely new approach to, to teaching and a new textbook to, to accompany this approach. And this new textbook is, is called Nonlinear Dynamics, a Concise Introduction Interlaced with Code. It is uh, written by myself and Ulrich Parlitz, my, my friend and co-author and mentor. And its pages are interlaced with real, runnable Julia code. And I will show you in a moment. The textbook will be published in Springer's undergraduate lecture notes in physics soon, probably in a couple of months after you're seeing this, uh, this presentation. So how does, this, how does this new approach work? Well, the first, in, in every chapter or, or every section, we follow the, the following approach. We first have some paragraphs that are introducing a, a concept and giving you its theoretical background. Then we have some other paragraphs that discuss the algorithms to compute the concept, to actually do this in practice. And then after this section, there is another section that is the code. It is a section that has a runnable code snippet 
that does whatever the algorithm do, uh, we discussed does. And it's written in the Julia programming language and it uses the dynamical systems library. This is the, the approach. This is what we do in every chapter. In fact, in every section of every chapter. The, and this is how it really, really, really looks in reality. So here you have three pages of the book. That's exactly how they look like. And you see the code snippet over here. Hide the, it's behind my face, but what can you do? And that's, that's the approach. That's it really. So now I will start delving deeper into this approach and uh, how to make it work and why it's so useful. So why is it that we have s there is that I believe there is so much re benefit into showing code? The reason is because first of all, discussing algorithms or having some kind of pseudocode bridges the gap between education and scientific research, and will also lead to reproducible science. But as you can imagine, this can be done with pseudocode as well. You don't need real runnable code. But I think having the real, the runnable code is the true gold. And why? Well, because many, many things. First of all, it gives you instant experimentation for the student. Second, it gives a starting point. So the student can take the code and not only experiment with it, but alter it and adapt it accordingly to a new situation. Furthermore, showing code shows you how to use an existing and hopefully good software library. And lastly, let's not forget researchers from other fields. So imagine senior scientists that are already outside the learning phase and the student phase, and they learned, they heard about method X and they really need to apply it. So these people may not have the time to go through an entire semester of lectures, but they would still appreciate having an, a, a usable uh, code snippet. So I think Julia is genuinely, truthfully, the most suitable language to do this in the world right now. There are many, many reasons for this. It's a large reason is the expressivity of Julia and that it allows you to have a one-to-one -one mapping between the, the code and the textual algorithm. You have all this Unicode uh, beautiful stuff and the concise code. But also you have very high performance and high quality libraries. And at least for the field of science I'm part of, the high performance is really, really, really important. So in the opening slide, I had an excerpt of this talk called Why Julia is the most suitable language of science. And there in this presentation, I delved much deeper into why I believe this is true. So I don't want to repeat myself more here. But this, this really is pretty much the summary. So in the remaining of this talk, I want to use an actual real example that students would learn about in my course and th so that I can make the remaining discussion grounded in reality. This example is called delay coordinates embedding. And it is a powerful technique for nonlinear time series analysis. And what makes it powerful is that it allows you to, to reconstruct or recreate full dimensional dynamics from a single measured time series. So let's see the process. Imagine that you have somewhere a real system and you go with a device and you measure something. For example, you might measure the, the voltage at some specific resistor or I don't know, something. And now you're, you're, you're thinking, okay, almost certainly the real system has much more degrees of freedom than just one. But you have measured a single time series, so let's say one degree of freedom in some, sort, some sense. And you would like to reconstruct all of them, the degrees of freedom. So it turns out this is very much possible. And the way you do this is you first start and you take your measured time series and you shift it forwards in time by some amount of time tau, which is called the delay time. So to clarify, I took the first time series, I replicated it and I shifted it a bit forwards in the in future. Okay? Then you have to repeat this process. So make another replicate and shift it furthermore into the future. And in total, you have to do this, let's say, d times. And this d is called the embedding dimension. It is, let's say, a parameter. For this example, d equals 3 is, let's say, OK, it's good. All right. So what you then do is you take each one of these time series and you have them as the new coordinates for a higher dimensional space. So to clarify, the first time series becomes the coordinate of the Sorry, the first coordinate, the second time series becomes the second coordinate, 
and so on and so forth. And now you see this time series now dictate a motion in three-dimensional space because the bedding dimension is three. This is the process. Now what's really cool is that I reveal to you that this is the original set that I took the, the, the measured time series from. And it is, uh, what happens is that it is uh, under some conditions guaranteed that these two sets are equivalent in the topological sense. And this is rigorous mathematical theory. This is not an empirical result. However, as I mentioned, this process has two parameters, the embedding dimension d and the delay time tau. And they are crucial and they have to be chosen optimally. So how does this work in the book? Well, as I mentioned in the introduction, we first have a section that introduces the concept of delay coordinates embedding and tells you the theory about it. Then there is another section that gives you algorithms to practically compute the embedding dimension and the delay time. And the last section is the code. And for this particular uh, topic, the code looks like this. So on the left figure we have a, sorry, on the left side we have a figure and on the right side we have a code snippet that produces that figure. Now, uh, you can only understand this code snippet in the context of the chapter, of course, right? Uh, I don't think you would be able to understand this by looking at it, but of course for someone that has read the chapter, then they know already the method to compute the optimal di uh, embedding dimension and they can understand what's going on. Now, this can only work with small, easy to read, intuitive code that is nevertheless performant. So this can only work with Julia, that's pretty much what I'm saying. And the other thing that you will notice is that these functions that you see here, they implement the algorithms for choosing the optimal uh, embedding dimension and delay time from the dynamical systems.jl library. Now, interestingly, while uh, some reviewers were reviewing the book, one of them looked at a similar figure and tell, told me, okay, what do I learn from this? So he asked specifically about the code snippet. What extra thing does the code snippet give? And I've, I thought about this for a bit, and after thinking, I realized that the answer is the obvious answer. <laughs> what you learn from this is how to make the figure. Because truthfully, just showing you a figure doesn't tell you how to make it. And not only that, but having this code that makes the figure provides the instantaneous experimentation a student needs. Because if you have this code snippet that produces the figure, you mean it means you have access to every single tool you potentially need to make this process. So with this Unicode over here, what I'm trying to say is <laughs> give a man a fish and uh, they will be happy for a day, but teach a man how to fish and they will be happy forever. So that's exactly what's going on here. We don't just give you a figure. We tell you, okay, that's how you make the figure, which is not the same at all. All right, so side remark, this really in, in, uh, increases student involvement and having a hands-on experience in the course. And later I will describe why this is very useful. So uh, another thing that is useful is interactive applications. My line of thinking here is as follows. We all agree, or we all know the saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. But then a video is worth a thousand pictures by definition. But then I say, okay, an interactive application is worth a thousand videos, which is a million pic uh, pictures, which is a billion words. So <laughs> if you think about it, interactive applications have a tremendous value <laughs> with respect to word count. What does this mean? This means create illustrative interactive applications for every occasion you possibly can. For example, we mentioned the delay time parameter tau in this uh, embedding process, and this needs an optimal choice. But why? Well, because if it is too small, then the reconstructed set becomes too stressed. If it is too large, the reconstructed set becomes too overfolded. So to illustrate uh, this Really, the best is to simply make an interactive application. So here I have set up this application. It has a, a 3D plot of the reconstructed set, 
and then there is a slider that decides the value of the delay time and it will show you how the set will change for different delay times. So I have recorded this uh, application and you see as we choose the uh, move the delay time around you f you see the problem of the overfolding yourself and you see the problem of stretching too thin yourself. And I think this is really a, a cru crucial to have at least a couple of such uh, occasions in teaching that the students themselves open up the interactive application and they discover new knowledge by themselves. So what I mean is that I give them this application without telling them these parts, right? Just let them explore and then they discover that if the delay time is too small, well, that's a problem. And if it's too large, that's also a problem. And then little by little, we can all together uh, conclude to the same knowledge. And knowledge that is discovered by the student is uh, attained, uh, is, let's say, remembered much more strongly than knowledge that I simply passively give to the student. So these interactive applications are really a game changer, uh, for at least for my course. So how do you make these interactive applications? Well, of course, you use uh, Makia.jl, which is literally too strong to be true. So huge shout outs to the Makia team for uh, making this and for their continued support. I personally have received a tremendous amount of support from Julius and Simon and many others. So thank you for that. And this code snippet over here is exactly how you make the animation, sorry, the application of the previous slide. So you can see it's really, really simple. You start up with a figure and you put a, a three-dimensional axis in this figure and then you put a slider in the figure. Here the slider is about the delay time. Then you initialize an observable that contains the reconstructed set. And that what you do is simply whenever the slider is triggered, you update the observable with a new reconstructed set that has a new delay time for the reconstruction. That's it. So, another important point. Consider the typical scenario where you learn a concept X in your bachelor's studies. For example, you learn, oh, this delay abetting exists and you can reconstruct dynamics from a measured time series. Then you start your PhD, you have some actual tangible system to study, and you need to apply concept X. Okay? Well, the problem is that if you have taken a traditional lecture in nonlinear dynamics, like I have uh, taken, then you have to learn how to actually obtain the delay time and the embedding dimension, because such practical aspects are typically not discussed. But then you have to write a, pro uh, a code that uh, does this. Now let me tell you something important. This bullet point is much easier than this bullet point. Writing the code typically takes more effort and is harder. So to really learn these things, what I think should happen is that there should be exercises that teach how to use a concept in practice, as if you are a researcher already working on the topic. How do you do this? Well, let me give, let me give you a couple of examples. The way we did this is that we set up an online repository with some exercise data. And then we use this exercise data to define practical exercises. For the chapter, uh, or sorry, for the topic I just presented, here is an example. It says load time series from exercise data sets 1, 3, 5, 12. For each one, try to achieve an optimal delay coordinate embedding using the traditional approach. So what I say here, traditional approach is uh, pretty much what I presented in, in these slides. And the subsequent exercises have similar tone. So implement the method that you learned about in this section for the maximum Lyapunov of exponent. Apply the result to data set uh, 2, which has something. So that's how it goes. Quick tip, be sure to solve the exercises yourselves first. Because <laughs> apologies to my students, I have given them a wrong exercise once. That was a big do-do from me. So don't do this. Be sure that you solve the exercises first yourself. All right, and now we come to an important point, perhaps even the most important point of this presentation. So let's first all agree, knowing how to use a high quality library is obviously advantageous. 
and it is twice as much advantageous for researchers from other fields that just want to calculate quantity x that is from my field, let's say nonlinear dynamics. That's fine. But there is a problem. This runs the risk of having people blindly applying methods without having a clue of what they do, what are their pitfalls, what should they be careful, uh, what are the limitations of the methods, and all of these things. And what we absolutely don't want is to raise students that do this. We absolutely don't want to raise students that say, oh, okay, I read in this book there is this uh, delay FFFN function. Oh, let's just use it. How do we battle this? We devised two ways to battle this. The first way is that in every single chapter, the starting exercises are exercises of this tone. They tell to the student, Okay, in this section, you learned about how to practically compute concept X. Write your own code to compute concept X. Then you can compare with, for example, this function from the dynamical systems library to ensure that your code works and does what it's supposed to do. The second way we tried to battle this is having a special paragraph or subsection in the very first chapter of the book. Which, and the paragraph is said a notorious trap, so we really hope this name will really attract some attention. I will not read the entire paragraph. The TLDR is, having code does not mean you have knowledge. You should really try to write your own code and understand the methods. Then you can compare with dynamical systems and use the off-the-self methods we have there. We also say that you can use the power of open source and Julia, because Julia is amazing in this regard. Not only is the source code of Julia super readable, but it is trivial to access it. For example, with the macro at edit. All right, so I mentioned this online repository. You can find this online repository here. Everyone can find it here. And this includes a book sample that is 10% of the book, links to Julia related tutorials, uh, all code to fully reproduce all figures, animations, and applications of the book exercise data sets, and multiple choice questions. Now, the last part is quite interesting. Um, what I found to be extremely, extremely pleasant, but not really related to code, is such live polling. What do I mean by that? So you go to an online polling service, and there you put in multiple choice questions. The goal of this is to increase student involvement. How does it look like? Once you have created an online polling, you can share a polling link or a QR code with the students. Live, during class, the students click on the link and then they go and see this, this is what they see. They see a question and then they can choose one of the multiple answers. After the students has, have finished choosing the answers, I show the results. So you would see uh, histograms over here. And then I start discussing with the students. I say, OK, you people that chose A, someone that chose A, can you please tell us why you think A is correct? And then the same with C, why you think C is correct? So I found this to be uh, really fun, and it uh, made students think, because uh, you know sometimes the students wander off in the lecture, and that's uh, quite often. It happened to me, it happens to everyone. But at least this keeps them more attached to the lecture. Final slide before conclusions, um, just a, you know some, some advertisement. Expect soon an announcement of the dynamical systems.jl version 2.0 uh, on the Julia discourse. What I'm showing here is some super cool animations of some fancy new stuff, you know, just to keep you to keep you hooked on what's going to what's going on. All right, so. Uh, I think we need to incorporate practical aspects and real code in lectures. And we have to do this to bridge this huge gap between education and research. And how do you do this? Well, the approach we followed is as, as follows. We incorporated real code snippets in the lectures and, and the book. And we motivated students to write and understand code. And we also taught theory as well as practical aspects hand in hand. Fin uh, not finally, but combined with these three points, 
we provide that exercise data that need to be analyzed in practice using computer code. Another very useful thing is to incorporate interactive applications and to try to teach interactively as much as possible. Uh, use polling, use Q&A, use interactive applications. The more things the students discover themselves, the more things they will retain after the lecture is done. So with this, I'm concluding my talk. Thank you all for listening and very happy to discuss further and answer any potential questions. Bye-bye.